CCW. I am Stacey, I am the children's intern. This morning we've got Colin Buchanan videos for the kids. Everybody can join in and everybody can watch. They're fantastic videos on the love of God. So they can be for kids, they can be for old ones, they can be for absolutely everyone in between. Feel free to fast forward if you would like to get straight to the message, but enjoy it if you do. Have a giggle, enjoy. Colin is fantastic and he really speaks about how God can help us. Love to see you soon. Keep your eyes on God and remember that He is always with us. Bye. <laughs> I've just been looking at a picture of one of our sponsored children. His name's Chris. And Chris doesn't live in Australia where I am now. Chris lives in the Philippines, which is a long, long way away. I wonder where you live. I wonder if there's something that God says to people everywhere. Hmm. Well, I found something that is in the Bible and it's something that God says to everyone. Somebody asked Jesus, What's the greatest commandment? And this is what he said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. That's a lot of alls, isn't it? And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love. It's precious. All right. I thought, hmm. I wonder what's a memory verse from the Bible that's about the greatest commandment, loving God. And I thought of Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, and it goes. Ready, here we go. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Whistle. <whistles> Try it. <whistles> if you can't whistle, go who? Who, 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 who. <laughs> Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Again, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Whistle. You can do the hoo hoo again. Hoo 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 hoo. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Ding! Well, that's a good verse. Trust God and acknowledge him. Do what he says in everything you do. That's how you love the Lord with all your heart. Now, what's a verse from the Bible? about loving other people, loving your neighbor. I know. Ephesians, no, let me think. Ephesians, chapter four, Ephesians four, verse 32. It goes, in the Bible, in Ephesians, chapter four, verse 32. God says, be kind to one another. God says, be kind to one another. It's only short. You try it. Ready? In the Bible, in Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 32. God says, be kind to one another. Again, God says, be kind to one another. Now, sometimes people change the beginning. I don't know why. They say, when your Bible's in the freezer. Uh, do you want to? No, we shouldn't. You, okay, we're going to do it that way. All right, here we go. When your Bible's in the freezer. Chapter 4, verse 32. God says, be kind to one another. God says, be kind to one another. One more. God says, be kind to one another. Last one. God says, be kind to one another. Nice. The two greatest commandments, love God and love your neighbor. Be kind to one another. And you can be kind to your family and the people very close to you. And you can be kind to your neighbor 
and the people that you see in your street or at the shops or people at school. And uh, we can be kind to people who don't even live near us. Really, that's why our family was sponsoring Chris. And uh, let me tell you about a special time, something very special that happened. I got to meet Chris. I flew from Australia all the way, a long, long way to the Philippines. And one morning after church, I went down, the bus was outside and someone said, there's someone waiting to meet you on this bus. And I climbed on and there was a seat next to Chris. And he looked at me and said, it's finally you. And I said, it's finally you. It was precious to meet Chris. And it's good to be kind by helping children like Chris. And it's good to be kind because God is kind. And it's good to be kind because being kind makes us feel precious and loved and treasured. Now there's a song about the love of God for us and I think it would be a good one to sing. Jesus loves me, this I know. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. The Bible tells me so. Will we pray? I'm going to close my eyes that helps me think about what I'm saying. You can pray with me. Our dear Lord and our God, we praise you because you are the great, high, perfect God. And we want to love you with all our hearts and with all our souls and with all our mind and with all our strength, just like you made us to do. And we want to love one another, love our neighbor, near and far, love our family, love those who need our help. Help us to do this, we pray, and be with us in times of trouble and times of hardship to know that Jesus loves us with his strong, strong love. And we pray in his name. Amen. Morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this second week of our uh, holiday series. I'm Dominique. And I'm Danny. And these are the pre-recorded services that we put together before the school holidays as we're on holidays as a family and also to give our tech team a break. Yeah, we hope you enjoyed today's service. We hope you've been enjoying the Colin Buchanan segments for especially for our families, but for everyone. And we hope that you enjoyed the message from the Psalms that um, Peter brought to us last week. And we're thankful to Peter Hill for his permission to use these sessions for the holiday series. We've got another one today, which is fantastic. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that it helps you, it encourages you in your faith walk. Yeah, let's head into a time of worship now. Enjoy the service. It's time. 
morning everyone and uh, welcome to the couch this is where we've been joining you uh, via video and tv for the last three months and it's been a really fascinating time for us to to simplify things in many respects and we miss you and we're looking forward to being everyone back together again but as we stop this morning and we take time to reflect on why we come together and as we take time to share communion in our own way, I just want to read you something from uh, Mark. This is how Mark records uh, the events of the Last Supper in Mark 14, 22. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this, take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. A very short and a very succinct summary by Mark of something that is incredibly profound. A simple breaking of bread and a very simple cup that they shared that signified a new covenant, a brand new way, a brand new entry into relationship with God. And it's by his body and by his blood that we are saved and that we are redeemed and that we have a relationship with Christ. And elsewhere we're told that as often as we do that, as often as we break the bread and, and share the cup, that we're to remember the Lord's death until he comes. And so this morning, in keeping with the simplicity of some of the things that we've experienced, I just invite you, wherever you are, maybe you're by yourself this morning, maybe you're with family, maybe you've invited some others over because you're allowed to, just ask you to take some time now to take bread in whatever form you have it, and take the cup, in whatever form you have it, take them both and take some time to think about just what Jesus has done for us, the simplicity of this new covenant and yet the profound nature of what it means for us, our sins forgiven and a life lived and an eternity to look forward to with him. Let me pray and then I'll give you some time by yourself to reflect on that. Lord Jesus, we want to stop this morning and thank you that you love us. Thank you that you loved us enough that you went all the way to the cross. Thank you that beforehand you instituted this very, very simple remembrance, bread and wine, a time to stop and to remember you. And so just in our own way and in our own time now, I pray that you would allow us just to reflect on that and to be thankful for all that you've given us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. CCW family, will you join me together as we pray this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together in prayer. That even in these times where we're spread out in our own houses, with our own families, and that we can't come together as a body to worship you, that we can do this um, via these means. And we, we thank you that we have that opportunity when so many people don't. We pray uh, for those families that are feeling isolated, for those that are really struggling, um, for many that uh, might be sick or unwell, that they will know that uh, there are people there for them, that you are there for them. Help us to be discerning of the needs of others. Help us to be wise and safe in the way that we uh, share and join together. Help us to support each other in the many different ways that um, we're able to do that, even when it can't be in person. Father, there are so many countries um, that are struggling in a more severe way than Australia, and we pray worldwide for peace 
um, for wisdom, for discernment for those leaders that are making decisions around this pandemic um, and just for the day-to-day -day ways that communities can continue to support each other. May your wisdom and your comfort infuse those moments and be there with each of us. Father, I just want to pray particularly for Josh and Jenny Hassan and their son Samuel as they come to us in a few weeks' time to take on the role um, of youth pastor here. We thank you for the blessing of Josh and his family and we just pray that as we embrace him and as he uh, begins to learn and get to know us as a community, that he will feel so strongly uh, supported and feel your comfort and wisdom. Father, I pray for all of our staff for the extremely um, busy last term that they've had for um, all the extra duties that have come and extra responsibilities as they've managed wisely this um, COVID situation. And we pray for um, some rest and reprieve for staff over this school holiday time, uh, just for a lightening of the load where possible for them. We thank you for their commitment to us as a body and to you as well. Father, we continue to pray for our elders too, for decisions that they are making, um, for wisdom for them, for comfort and peace, for unity as they um, deal with many of those broader issues that we as a community might be facing. And Father, once again, we thank you for the many ways that you've blessed us during this time. For, for some, it's been fantastic family time together. And again, we thank you that we can still be together even when it's through a screen and uh, we have for continued wisdom as we find ways to join together in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome back. Well, I hope you got some sort of feeling of the emotion that was wrapped up in that um, poem that we just looked at. And, uh, and now I want us to look at Psalm 19. Psalm 19 is a different sort of poem again. Psalm 19 is a good example of where poetry can actually also deal with serious ideas. Just because poetry touches our emotions, just because poetry expresses the heart, it doesn't mean that it can't address significant theological and serious truth and thought. And so we're going to find that a little bit in this psalm. This psalm is in two distinct parts. You don't really need to colour in to see that the two, there are two distinct parts in this psalm. And, and those two distinct parts have raised the thought whether they might have been two psalms at some stage that were separate but have been joined, maybe by David or maybe by some later editor, um, or maybe uh, those two psalms have been two threads running through the poet's mind and as the different threads ran through his mind, he found some unifying idea and so he combined those threads into a single psalm. The first part of the psalm would appear to be about creation and the second part of the psalm would appear to be about the word of God. So is it two psalms or is it one psalm? Well, you can have a think about that as you read it through. Um, but what we, what we have here is what theologians would refer to as the general revelation and the specific revelation of God. We'll come back to that as we go through this thing, as we go through this psalm. So as I've said before, how is God's name used in this psalm? Well, God's name is used in verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. God is there in verse 1. But then we don't see God directly again until we get to verse 7. And when we get to verse 7, the name of God is used in pretty well every line of the verses 7, 8 and 9. And then it drops out again until we get to the end of the psalm. So God is here, but he's here in a different way. The word heaven Underline, I've said to you the, where the word heaven is used and you'll see that it's in the first part of the psalm and it tends to provide two um, sort of subsections within the first part of the psalm. I've asked you to underline the word coming before of the Lord in verse 7 to 9 and so if you do that you'll see those words stand out. The verbs, I've also asked you to underline and you'll see those standing out and the adjectives. 
And so we've got all those sort of things that as I talk about the psalm now, hopefully will help you to see some of the structure of the psalm and some of the development of ideas that take place within it. So what we've then got is, is, the, um, is in the first part of the psalm, we've got all these verbs which are, which are there. The heavens declare, the skies proclaim, day after day they pour forth speech, they display knowledge. And then in verse 3 we've got other words which add to those which are words about speech. So there's no speech or language where their voice isn't heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words. And so what we've got here in, in, um, in verses 1 to 4, we've got this overwhelming statement about speech. There is a statement being made, someone is speaking. Now who's speaking? Well, it's the heavens are speaking. The heavens, this, this, uh, this, this creation of God is speaking. And it's speaking, we're told, it's, it's proclaiming, it's pouring forth speech, it's displaying knowledge, it's, it's going out through the whole world. This is, this is profuse speech. This isn't just saying God said. This is a poet employing all the powers of their craft to make the point that God is speaking prolifically about something. Now what that is, um, we are not told except that we're told that it is declaring his glory. This speech happens day after day. It's, it's repeated. It's not something that is just said once and forgotten. It's, it's not only day after day. It's not powerful and prolific, but it goes into the whole world, to the ends of the earth, the, to every language, to every place. This speech of God transcends all sorts of national borders. It transcends all sorts of languages. It's powerful, and as I say, it's prolific. And, this, and this, the psalm just nails that point, and it does it by this repetition, but each repetition is a little bit different. And so in these powerful pictures, we've got God speaking repeatedly in all languages to the whole earth. But then we've got this strange thing happens in the middle of verse 4. So we've verse, um, verses 1 to the first half of verse 4 is all about words of speech. But then in verse 4 we've got the heavens. In the heavens he's pitched a tent for the sun. That's a strange idea, isn't it? The sun has got a tent that's pitched for it, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. What is this on about here? This picture of the sun having a tent pitched for it. He's like a bridegroom. He's like a champion. Well, I've had a little bit to do with some bridegrooms over the years. And it's interesting. I don't think I've ever been to a wedding where someone has said to me, Peter, can you just show me who is she marrying? You know, who's the man here? Well, we all know that weddings are about the girls. But somehow or other, the bridegroom has got a certain confidence about him at his wedding day and, and it's almost tangible and it's, it's kind of, that's what this picture's on about. You can't miss it. One of the jobs that I used to get given at schools to do was to hand out the second, third or fourth ribbons at athletic races. What else do you do, get, get someone to do who's got no idea about anything about sport? Well, that's a good thing to get them to do. And I can remember one day standing at the, at the end of a 100 metre race, the open race. So these are, these are young men of 17 or 18. And, and they're thundering down the track uh, in their 100 metre race. And I'm trying to work out who's going to come first, second or third. And it hit me. These guys are men. And you, and you look at these athletes and, and they're men. And when the winner is won... He's got a certain sort of swagger about him. He might not be trying to be arrogant, but he's won. And he's a man and he's won against other men. And here is when you take that to a, a national level or to a world level and a champion, you can pick the champion. When you're watching the video, you know who's won the race. And so what this is, what this is saying is that the sun is like a bridegroom. The sun is like a champion. The sun parades across the sky 
not with arrogance, but just simply making a statement. The sun is the sun, and the sun is powerful, and the sun does what it does. It rises at one end of the heavens, it makes its circuit to the other, and nothing is hidden from its heat. And so here we've got the same sort of repetition of ideas as we had in the first part, except it's not about speech, but it's re-emphasizing again the daily occurrence. It's emphasizing again the fact that it's accessible to everybody. And it's emphasising again that language is no barrier. What we've got here is one example of how the glory of God proclaims daily to the whole world in creation what's going on. It's a powerful picture. Although it's a picture that often you'll scratch your head about and think, how does this work? And you might have a different way, but that's fine. And then we go to the second part of the psalm. The law of the Lord is Perfect, reviving the soul. So here we've got the law of the Lord is perfect. The next line says the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. The next line says the precepts of the Lord are right. Here we've got this parallelism, building a picture. It's a multifaceted picture. Don't get hung up on, on what the particular words mean as the law or the statutes or the precepts. Don't get hung up on that. Just take the whole picture and and let it hit you. This is the word of God. And notice it's the commands of the Lord. It's the ordinances of the Lord. And notice the descriptions, the adjectives. They're perfect. They're trustworthy. They're right. They're radiant. They're pure. They're sure. Notice those adjectives. Don't they build a picture? The adjectives, the words, and they're all the, all the Lord, they're, they're his. And what do they do for the person? They revive the soul. They make wise the simple. They give joy to the heart. They give light to the eyes. And, the, and, and you'll notice that a couple of times I've sort of stopped and paused around about verse 9 there. Because something happens between verse 9 and 10. You see, you might be forgiven for thinking that this parallelism is a bit wooden, that the only creativity that the psalmist has got is that they bring in a different word for the law or the statutes or the precepts or the commands. But then you see in that sequence, law, statutes, precepts, commands, fear. The fear of the Lord. Is the fear of the Lord another way of describing God's word? Or is the fear of the Lord something else? I think myself it's something else because I think that, that what we're taking here is, is, this, is the poet isn't being wooden. The poet isn't just saying, oh yes, I've got to have a line here to match that line there and, and I'm locked into these ideas. The poet's not being wooden. The poet's being creative. The poet's got a little bit of movement going on. And so the poet is moving from the word of God to something else. And so what we've got then is, is, is this picture that's coming because at the end of verse 9, we've got the, this, this pattern that we've had all of a sudden changes. And so then they are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. So, so what the psalmist has done is given us all these ideas about the Word of God and and what the Word of God is like and how it works and the impact that it has. But then he moves on to this um, incredible picture of the preciousness and the value of the Word of God and the enjoyment of the Word of God. And so in in these words, we've not just got a law that has to be obeyed, but we've got a law which is rich and beneficial and fruitful and and. And then we come to verse 11, which in, in, is, the, is the effect of God's word. It's seen in the heavens, it's heard in his law. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them is great reward. So here in, in this verse, we've got this idea of warn and reward balancing each other a little bit. And that's what it is for the person of faith. The word of God for the person of faith is a warning, but it's also a reward. It's seen, it's rich, it's in the heavens, it's in the scriptures. God speaks to us 
However he speaks, we're warned and we're rewarded. Now then the psalmist goes on. Who can discern his errors? When God speaks, the way that this psalm pictures God as speaking, where does it leave us standing? Well, the poet here is conscious of his errors. And he asks for forgiveness for his hidden faults. He asks that he would be protected from his willful sins, that they won't rule over him. He's asking for forgiveness and he's asking for protection. In light of everything that God has revealed, the psalmist is aware of his, of his own failures, even the ones he doesn't know about. And he wants forgiveness, he wants protection, that they won't take over him and rule him. And then he says, I'll be blameless. I'll be innocent of great transgression. The psalmist, in view of this God who speaks so powerfully, wants to be innocent. He wants to be forgiven. He wants to be delivered from his sins. But then he goes one step further in verse 16. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. So he doesn't just want to be sinless. He wants to be pleasing to God. This is not just the absence of the negative. This is the presence of the positive. And the poet puts it powerfully. And so the psalm finishes with, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That's the personal reflection that comes at the end of this psalm. We could turn to the New Testament and see what the New Testament does with this psalm too. Think about it. What are the emotions there? How do those emotions touch you? How do you want to join in with this psalm? Do you find yourself drawn to this psalm? Do you find yourself saying, I want to look at creation with a fresh view? Do you find yourself saying, I want to read God's word with a fresh view? Do you find yourself saying, Lord, please forgive me my hidden sins. Please deliver me from my willful sins. Please help me to be blameless, please. Help me to be pleasing to you, remembering that the one I'm speaking to is the one who in speaking to me has revealed himself as the rock and the redeemer in whom I can trust. The last psalm that I thought we'd look at today is Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is different again. The first psalm was a psalm of, of quiet faith in the provision of God. The second, the second poem was a lament. The third one was this, um, was this poem about... Um, about creation, and now we've got what's often called a royal psalm. It's a royal song, often thought to, be, to have been used at a coronation in the temple. The speaker would probably, in that case, be a court prophet. The speaker doesn't really matter to us if, I'm, if all we're reading is the psalm, but if we're thinking about this psalm in the light of the New Testament, the speaker does matter, and Jesus tells us who the speaker was in the New Testament. Um, imagine the hope that comes when a new king is being crowned. Maybe the old king was a good king and you're hoping that the new king will be a good king too. Maybe the old king was a waster and you're hoping that the new king will be better than the old king. Maybe you're just young and you're sick of the old king and you want a new king and you're hoping that the new king will be good. But there's a lot of hope that's tied up in the advent of the coronation of a king, especially in a country where the king had real power and where what the king said went and what the king believed and the way that the king acted made a definite impact on the quality of life of the people that lived under his reign. And so we come to Psalm 110. References to God. Four times in this psalm. Well, three times and probably four. Verse 1, verse 2, verse 4 and verse 5. What about words that indicate God has spoken? In verse 1 and verse 4. What about what God says? Verse 1 and verse 4. What about the pronouns? It's all about you and he. So let's look at this psalm. The Lord says to my Lord. 
That's the way it starts. In English, it probably sounds okay. One commentator translates this Yahweh's oracle to my master. And I reckon that's a, that's a really good translation. Yahweh's oracle. Yahweh hasn't just spoken. Jehovah has spoken with authority. Now, of course, Jehovah always speaks with authority. He never speaks without authority. But he's spoken with authority. Whereas in verse 4, the Lord has sworn. Now, these are both serious statements. So this psalm is in two parts, and each part is introduced by a serious statement of God. God is speaking, and he speaks to my Lord, sit at my right hand, and this would be taken in the coronation as being addressed to the king. So God is anointing the king, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. If this is only of the king, then what we've got is idealisation and we've got um, hyperbole and court rhetoric all combined here and to an extreme. So from a human point of view, if that's what this is about, this psalm is saying that God anoints and appoints the king. But really, the, the psalm is saying more than that. Sit at my right hand, and this is what the New Testament does with it. It points out that, that this is serious, that this is what was achieved in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The victory that, the, that this psalm anticipates for the king is extensive and it's complete. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing. So the, the victory is great. One of the things that a king needs is a willing army. And he's going to have a willing army in verse 3. But it's going to be more than a willing army. It's going to be an army that in some way is a holy army. And it's going to reflect the creative truth that God is the creator. And yet it's almost as though the youthful vigor of the king is going to be evident in the army as well. So it's not really a very straightforward verse, that second half of verse 3. And I've probably made it sound simpler than it really is. But what we've got in this psalm is the promise that the new king is going to be a victorious king. Now then, the, the Lord has sworn an irrevocable oath. That's what it means to swear. It reminds us a little bit of the promise God made to David. And so he won't change his mind, but this promise is different. Whereas the first promise is a promise about reigning, the second promise is a promise about being a priest. Forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now this is weird because in the Old Testament the king wasn't the priest. The king was in some ways a representative of God to the people and the people to God. And in some ways the king personified the people to God. But the king was never the priest. I don't think David even took it on himself to sacrifice the offerings. The king wasn't the priest. The sacrifice was the priest's job not the king's job. And so when it came to the sacrifice in the temple, although the king might have had the best seat in the temple, he was only a person who needed the priest to offer the sacrifice on his behalf. And so we've got a weird thing here in terms of the Old Testament, which is this figure Melchizedek, for all of his shadowy past, is the only precedent we've got. But when we come to the New Testament, we find that this is said about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the psalm goes on again. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead, crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook beside the way. Therefore, he'll lift up his head. This, this psalm, whilst it might have had initial application to the human king, this psalm only has meaning when it's understood about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it only has meaning when this king really is the Messiah who will be expected. At the stage when it's written, the Messiah is not a great figure. But as we continue over coming studies, we'll find that this idea of the Messiah becomes a more important figure 
in the, in, the, in the thinking of the nation of Israel. But at this stage, it's not that important. So there's a lot of hope in this psalm, but it's hope that is never going to be fulfilled in the human king. It's hope that is only ever going to be fulfilled in the final coming of the Messiah and the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's really interesting to, to think about poetry at this point because I've made the point several times today that poetry is about emotion. It's about, um, it's about our heart. It's about our feelings. Now, emotion and heart and feelings are important, but they only have value when there's substance behind them. And so hope in the king is only well-placed hope if the king is a good king. And so hope in the king really is always going to be let down. It's always going to be disappointed when it's a human king. The only time the hope in the king, the only time the hope expressed in this psalm is ever going to be fulfilled is when God is the king and God's king Messiah reigns. And so we need to remember that in all of our poetry. Poetry is not just designed to make me feel good. Poetry is designed to help me, biblical poetry is designed to help me understand God and understand God's ways and the way that God works and in understanding God's ways and the way that he works, then I have a well-placed hope then I have a well-placed sense of security. Then I have a well-placed sense of optimism. It's only when I understand what God has done that the poems, when they speak to my heart, have such power. Early in this year, Pam and I went to a conference in Sydney. I don't know how many people were at this conference, maybe 500, not mega. They had a music group which... Um, which really is not my scene. I, I, I kind of like their music so long as it would be turned down to about a tenth of the volume. Um, it was one of those groups you could actually feel your body <laughs> to their music. Well, one day they sang How Great Thou Art, a great old hymn of another generation. They sang How Great Thou Art. You wouldn't have a clue whether anyone in the conference was singing or not. The music from the front was so loud. So loud. I wouldn't have a clue. I was singing. I know that. But I don't know whether anyone else was. And then they come to a verse. And when they got to this verse, the music just stopped. There was no music. But there were 500 people singing with all of their hearts. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, send him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. That's not just good poetry. That's not just something that draws the emotions of 500 people and makes them sing. But it's the truth of God that touches our hearts. And when the truth of God touches our hearts, it doesn't just leave us cold and sterile. When the truth of God touches our hearts, it sets a fire ablaze and we want to sing it and we want to quote it and poetry becomes terribly powerful and impactful in that sort of environment. Please read the poetry of Scripture. Please absorb it into your heart. Please learn it. Please recite it. Please understand it. And please rejoice in the God of Scripture who gives the poetry power and impact and value in our lives day by day. Let's pray. Our loving God in heaven, we thank you so much that you are a God who's a God of love, that you're a God who communicates yourself to us. You're a God who understands the deepest passions of our hearts. And our Father, I pray that you would help us to allow your truth to inform our hearts, that our hearts might sing to your glory that we might rejoice in all that you have done and that the poetry of your word might express our thoughts as well as the thoughts and the feelings of men and women of another generation, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thanks for being here with us today for our service. We hope it's been helpful and meaningful for you. Yeah. And if there's anything that stirs for you and you'd like someone to contact you or to pray with you over anything, you can find us uh, either by contacting the church office and Pete is around and he can help you, or you can contact us through our website. Have a great week. <laughs>